My name is Milan Bradovic. I'm the chairman of the environment board here in Sweden, in Malmö. And I'm also the, uh, the chair of the Eurocity Environment Forum. So I'm quite involved in the environment here. It's, a <coughs> it's well known that the aviation industry is responsible for 2% of the global CO2 emissions in the world. But not many people are aware that IT is responsible for 3% of the global emission. 3%, it's, it's quite a lot. <coughs> and the IT sector is in continuous growth, which means we have a bigger and bigger problem if we don't react on that now. But unlike the aviation industry, the IT sector <coughs> has a huge possibility to decrease the energy parts, energy efficiency <coughs> in our society. In the construction of a new school here in Malmö, we combine two systems which traditionally operate independently, <coughs> and by doing that, we increase the overall efficiency and identify synergies between systems. The security system, access, and lighting system operates together with heating and ventilation system to create these benefits. Motion detectors become dual function, managing both, both energy and security system, and ensuring that energy, <coughs> energy use is adapted to current building use. Similar to the security system, Redis open windows and doors and regulate the heating and ventilation accordingly. In the evening, when everyone goes out, the alarm goes on and the building's empties. It goes essentially into energy saving mode, shutting down lighting, decreasing ventilation, heating. The approach is quite simple but effective. Heat demand in this school is 50% lower than in ordinary school in other sites of Malmö. The energy requirement is 20% lower. I work as IT manager in the Swedish church here in Sweden, in Malmö. So it's easy to understand why I think that green IT and ICT is the easiest way to lower the cost and reduce the emissions. You will hear more about this during the conference. As the chairman of the environmental board, I often get invited to meetings and conferences. And there's always two questions that pops up. It's also the same, same too. Which is the biggest threat to the environment? And <coughs> um, why is Malmö such a success when it comes to sustainability? And those questions are actually two easy questions for me to answer. The reason that Malmö is such a success are four reasons, actually. The fourth, first reason is our mayor, Ilmar Repolu. He started transformation from a grey industry city to a sustainable city of innovation by setting long-term goals and high goals. The second is the political majority in Malmö, who continues to work setting high goals and long-term goals. So you can see it's long-term goals and high goals that is a success. The third is the network and projects. Projects we do in Sweden and other countries, we can all learn something from those. And then the networks as well, we can see what other people are doing and we can take that solution and implement it in our city. Some solution is hard to implement, but some are easier. The fourth is the foundings. A city like Malmö can't afford to do projects without foundings. So we have to see if so we can get foundings from regional, national level and the AU. And the second question, what's the biggest challenge, the biggest threat? Well, something that is pharmaceutical is the wa in the wastewater is the biggest threat. But to have a solution for this in Mannheim, would already remove 75% of the pharmaceuticals to quite low cost. Other people may make sure that they'll talk about noise as the biggest threat, but we have solutions here as well. We have clean tires, which is started in Rotterdam. We have green roofs, like we have here in the city of Malmö. And we have to develop the public transport. So it's quite easy, actually, if you just start to implement it. And so on and so on. There's obviously several more challenges. But for me, the biggest problem is politicians. That's the biggest problem. Politicians that are afraid, hesitating. Politicians waiting for the perfect solutions. But there are no perfect solutions. We have to start using the best practice on the market and to do it now. There's too many politicians reacting to the climate threat. But we in Malmö react and act. And that's why we are the most sustainable cities in the world. Thank you. <coughs> And I'll welcome Per Gaunquist, our moderator. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Peg Donquist. I'm a journalist and author specializing in sustainability and how you can make money of it. And I'm honored to be here and to help you guide through this day. Uh, there's a lot of people in here this room, and there will be more coming eventually. Uh, and there's also been a bunch of people who are following us online, so I welcome you as well. As a columnist, I'm privileged enough to travel the world and meet with clever people uh, in interesting places and hear them, thought, hear them thoughts on sustainability. In the past year, I visited the Americas, I visited Asia and of course been traveling around Europe. And when I do so, I try to be, meet with business leaders, with students, with people from the NGO sector and public officials to try to get their opinion and their perspective on where sustainability is heading. Surprisingly, it's like many of them are speaking with one voice. And this is the conclusion they come to. Sustainability will change the world and will change the way we act in the next 10 years, more than internet has done in the past 10 years. And that's because it all comes down to resources. We have to use resources wisely, be them physical or monetary or human. Another conclusion. The world is not global at all, it's local. Climate treaties might be global, but they are all implemented locally. Corporate visions might be global, but they need to be acted on locally. Political consensus might be global, but the solutions need to be agreed on locally. Humans might be everywhere on this planet, but they originate from somewhere. I might have an EU flag on my passport, I might be able to vote in Sweden, but for and most I'm from Borsta, a small city of 10,000 inhabitants, just an hour's drive from here. And I think that sort of local connection is even more important today than it has been before. Last week I was in Mexico and I was in Mexico City. Mexico is a country played by corruption and violence. 98% of all crimes never lead to a case in court and corruption are everywhere. But I was pleased to find out that the air was cleaner than ever. And they now successfully roll out a system of biking landing station across the city. And why? Because of the energy and the persistence of local uh, public servants. It is only by understanding the local context and the local politics that we can understand the local potential and make it happen. And so I'm delighted to stand in front of you. You are the ones making things happen. It's not Mr. Cameron, it's not Monsieur Hollande, it's not Signore Monti curbing greenhouse emissions, it's you. It's not the European government that is sort of cutting energy use. It's you. You're the one that sort of mapped that path to the future by understanding where we are today. You're the ones that make sure that visions don't become hallucinations, but they are acted on and implemented. You're the ones tackling the fact that 80% of our energy use is related to cities, and you're the ones taking, taking action. But you're also feeling lonely. You're also feeling lost sometimes, and that's why we're here. You're here to share experiences, you're here to get inspired by each other, you're here to find new allies that can help you. You're here to experience how energy action planning can be and feel easy. You're here to meet new people and get to know them, you're here to know their strengths, their talents and maybe also hidden talents. So let's kick off this conference by standing up, all of you, and applauding ourselves. And also, and also, give a pat on the back to the next person next to you, because they're doing a great job as well. <laughs> uh, before we open up the stage for our first set of speakers, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our coordinators. Um, the City of Malmö, um, ECLE Europe, the Covenant Capacity Project Coordinator. If you want to share the insights you're getting here today um, with the rest of the world, the official hashtag is uh, CovCap12, C-O-V-C-A-P-1-2. Some practical information, there are toilets in the building outside and you'll find them, it's easy. If you have green passes for bus and trains, they were on the back of your badges. Um, apparently I lost mine already, uh, but you shouldn't do so. Uh, and they are all, way, they're all only valid uh, in 22 hours, but only in the city of Malmö. So if you want to go on a vacation to Copenhagen, pay for it yourself. 
If you're pres- all of you participating in the reception tonight at the restaurant called Hip, uh, you'll get a voucher for a complimentary glass of wine or beer. Uh, if you want something more, you can purchase that on site. And if you're going on a tour tomorrow morning, you'll meet at Hylje Info Point, just adjacent to the station uh, outside here. Uh, not uh, just outside, but over there at the Malmö Arena at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And while you're at it, don't mix the great exhibition, which is downstairs. Whenever there's a pause, you can go down there and find new inspiration. With that, I'd like to turn to our first plenary session, uh, which has the grand question. We are here to get insight into the important issues that impact cities across our continent and how the green economy and striving for increased quality of life is at core of many governments across Europe. Our first speaker leads the climate and air team at European Secretariat at ICLE, um, and she's guiding the strategic direction and dealing with team and project management. Let's give him a warm hel- hand to welcome Marike van der Staden. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me quickly get my presentation up and running. There we go. So, yes, from my side also a very, very warm welcome. I see many faces I know, many I do not know, and it's wonderful to welcome you in the beautiful city of Malmö, our host today. Now, Malmö has very interesting things to show you, uh, and throughout the day we've created a program for you that we find exciting, and we hope you do too. It has many different dimensions, because local action, when you deal with climate and energy, has very many facets. And the biggest facet of all is you, the person, the people we need to get involved in this. And that brings me to introducing to you the Covenant Capacity Project. I am the project coordinator um, of this European Commission funded project, and we are grateful for the funding we get from under the Intelligent Energy Europe program. This is the kind of project that brings Europe together. Uh, We have partners, from 19 countries um, involved in dealing with this project. And we are a group of mixed experts, and I will introduce the program or the project consortium to you very briefly. But before I go into that, I want to say, why did we start this project? There are many Intelligent Energy Europe projects that are funded dealing, all of them, with the topic of sustainable energy. And we at ICLA Europe have seen that there is a need for much more capacity amongst local governments, amongst municipalities, the local level of government, uh, where we bring together, on the one hand, political decision makers who might come from any background. It could be a, a dentist, a baker, and these people do not necessarily know anything about climate or energy. And it is our aim and our intention to train them and to show them what makes this an important focus area to deal with, and also to show how they can deal with it, because then they are empowered to take good decisions. If you do not have the information, you cannot take proper decisions. And um, our focus is, on the one hand, on these policy makers, but on the other hand, also the municipal staff. We know most of the communities, local communities in Europe, are small to medium-sized. The mega cities are doing reasonably fine, they have a lot of money, their budget is not a problem. The smaller communities are heavily impacted on by the economic crisis in many countries, and they need to start thinking, streamlining their activities, making sure that every single euro or whatever currency they use counts. And our intention is to point those municipal staff to the right or interesting tools and guidance options. There is a lot out there, and it's quite confusing. It's a little bit of a jungle. So in, through the Covenant Capacity Project, we point them to specific issues, to specific tools, to specific guidance material, and some of that you will hear today. Now, why? Why is climate and energy so interesting? We do know climate change is a reality today, and we have to aggressively mitigate. That means aggressively reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. In the urban context, we typically talk about carbon dioxide, but also methane is interesting when you think about the old landfill that is releasing methane that you can use as an energy source. We have, in a local community context, P2 
people, because people make up that local community. And the people consist of people who live in houses, live, work in office buildings or hospitals, get their education in schools, buildings, quite a hot topic. Transport, they walk, they cycle, they use the bus, they use their car. Mobility is a hot topic. All of that feeds back to mitigation. And in this sense, there are many, many options for action. And this is also something we want to share with you today, to give some highlights and zoom in on some of the communities that want to share their good practice and encourage you to take your message back home to your community and to others to mobilize. Now, climate change mitigation is one aspect. However, we also have energy security. Typically, local governments in Europe have not really had to focus on energy as a topic. That is seen as a national mandate or a provincial or a sub-national level, government level topic. Why look at local, local energy security? Because you are responsible to make sure that your co-citizens in your community can afford energy, and we know prices are soaring and they are going to keep on climbing as fossil fuels get more and more depleted. And obviously, the um, energy security is also not only linked to affordable energy, but to stable energy. And our local, uh, or our, in general, our energy and electricity grids are getting old in Europe. We've also seen this in the US, happening in some other places where overuse, because suddenly maybe you have a heat wave and everybody switches on their air conditionings, the grid collapses. That's energy security. And we need to start thinking about that because the climate is changing and you at the local level need to look at these issues. This brings me to the word community resilience. Protect your community. Assess where are your threats, where are your opportunities, and build up your community resilience around that. Now, I think, third topic, green urban economy. Everybody wants to make money and have a good quality of life. For that, you need money in many cases, but good quality of life also means happiness and at being at peace with yourself. So I connect these two very closely. The green economy was the topic at the Rio Plus conference, uh, Rio Plus 20 conference in Rio de Janeiro. And there our national governments came together to discuss the green economy. ICLA Europe and ICLA other offices together with other local government associations brought the green urban economy on the agenda because economy is in the local context again. And when we look at energy, you can generate energy in your local com community and keep that money cycli cyc cycling about in the local regional um, economy and not export your money because you're importing oil, for example. So these are interesting things that the politicians in particular need to think about because they are responsible for the good quality of life of their citizens. Now, the consortium we brought together um, knows and understands the knowledge gap at the municipal level. We know because we are in a democracy, um, there are regular local elections with new people coming in, and again, they need to get improved capacity so that they can make informed decisions. The technical staff also rotate. The good guys get grabbed up sometimes by the private sector, and there's a continuous need to train the younger people and to get the knowledge from the older people, and sometimes to train the older people and bring in the knowledge from the younger guys who are trained on more environmental aspects, which was missing. That was not a topic that we studied when, <coughs> when we were older. And I say when we were older because I'm actually older than I look. We know we need to raise awareness. And awareness is not just about threats. It's also about opportunities. There are, in this changing world, opportunities that we need to reach out and that sustainable energy at the local level opens up vast, vast opportunities that we just need to explore. And you need to explore that in your context. And our intention through Covenant Capacity is to open up doors, create systems and procedures to help you gain knowledge from the technical to the policy to the planning focus. Now I bring you to our, our consortium of 19 partners. 19 partners is a big group to deal with, and we are a wonderful, committed group of people involved in this, many more than 19 people. I think we have about 45 people actually involved in the project. And when we set up the project, we decided we need a mix. Yes, we need energy experts. 
the technical experts who know about action planning, who know about greenhouse gas inventory. Um, but we also need people who are professional adult education experts. And there we have ZSI from Austria, IHS from the Netherlands and FCG from Finland. Our technical experts actually also include the cities and the associations. Um, we brought cities in to bring that local government perspective and we'll introduce these city people to you as well today. Uh, it inclu obviously includes Malmö, our host, and also Padova from Italy, Koprivnica from Croatia and Burgas. Um, and our association and networks, because they again have another perspective. They represent their members, they work with cities, towns and villages, and they understand the national context or the European context, or both. And this is a wonderful group to work with, and I would like to take this opportunity to also thank all my partners for their wonderful work. It's a real pleasure to engage with all of you. Now, what is covenant capacity? I've given you a very brief introduction, but I want to show you in practical terms what can you, as an individual, get out of this. We are focusing on 15 countries in Europe as a priority, but it actually what we develop is for European cities, towns and villages. Uh, if you can understand English, we can at least offer you a basic introduction into many of the work we do, um, activities we do. So we are creating an early uh, and easy online learning platform, which will be launched very soon. And this is for the political leaders and the technical staff. Also, this is in two levels. So for the startup cities, we are offering a very easy, quick introduction. And for the more advanced cities that already have an action plan, for example, we are offering inspiration and ideas. Because we know our 45 people are not enough to do an active trainer program in these countries, we have a train the trainer program. And if you are an expert and you're working for an energy agency or for a local government association, you are very warmly invited to connect to our train the trainer program. And we will train you on being a good trainer, how to speak well, how to speak well on these topics that I'm going to introduce to you. And then there are 92 cities and towns that are the happy recipients of our support. And I hope, uh, I think there are a few here as well in the audience. So we will help them with their practical step-by-step -step sustainable energy action plan. Now, when you look at the wording SIAP, these are, we show these acronyms, very brief, um, and we use them without explaining what they mean. Uh, but SIAP is one of those that you need to focus on. It means sustainable energy action plan. And what is our end result? We hope and we wish to empower local governments, any shape, any size, any group, to also join the Covenant of Mayors if they so wish, and if they do not wish, to at least have them empowered to act, to engage, because that is what it all comes down. What are we training them on? Eight topics linked to energy. Greenhouse gas inventories. This is something you need to have to understand what is your starting point so that you have something to measure against in the future. And you ideally need to do a regular greenhouse gas inventory, or just maybe just so zoom in on one particular greenhouse gas emission, carbon dioxide, for example. You have to develop your SIAP, your action plan. And when you do that, you have to consider all the following topics. And I put at the top, stakeholder involvement, because if without people, you will not reach your objectives. You need to get your people on board your municipal council, get them motivated, get them on board because they take the decisions, your municipal staff, because they are actually implementing. And this is not only the unit or the team that works on cl with climate or energy. This is also the guys dealing with procurement, with transport, with buildings, with waste, with water, and back to stakeholder involvement with people. Your communication people need to be on, on board. And what are we doing in this context? Four key activities. Reduce it, reduce your emissions through energy savings and efficiency, reducing waste, clean it. We need to switch to clean fuels, renewable energy sources, ideally local production and local use, so that you stop importing oil and exporting money and using your local waste as a resource. You need to control it. And in particular, when I talk about control, it's traffic control, reducing traffic, getting people to switch to cycling and walking, offering wonderful integrated public transport <coughs> potentials, 
and switching to green fleets when you have your own municipal fleet. Last but not least, monitor and report it. This is again conducting a regular inventory, reporting to your council, reporting to your community, and if you are clever, reporting to the Covenant of Mayors because you've signed up to that, and to the international platform, the Carbon Cities Climate Registry. Why are these two things so important? The Covenant of Mayors is the major initiative in Europe, and we will hear some speakers addressing this from various angles. But I invite you to link to this, because then you are stronger when you connect to many, many other local governments that have signed up. You can lobby together, you can work together, you can use the support networks in place together. And Carbon, what you do at the European level, you can also do at the international level. Show that you're interested in financing, that we can change those financing lines away from wasted money to focused money for local climate and energy action. We work in 15 countries, but what we do is for Europe, for all cities and towns and villages in Europe, if you're interested. So our main focus, would we have three groups. The primary focus have more intensive activities, and that include Bulgaria, Croatia, Estonia, Greece, Italy, Poland, Romania, and Slovenia. Secondary focus are where more cities are more advanced, but there are also still startup cities and towns. That would be Finland, France, Sweden, and the UK. And then to a smaller focus, because essentially we ran out of money, Austria, Germany, and Slovakia, but we're looking at alternatives to engage more actively there. How do we work? Very quickly, because you will be hopefully exploring that with us online. We have an online training platform in English for all local governments. Easy guidance, hints, tips, and tools, and advice for the more um, advanced communities. We, have offer, we offer study tours like the one in Malmo, and we will have three more coming up, and I'm curious to see how uh, those cities will shape the study tours because they want to share with you what they are busy doing, and some wonderful things are happening at the local level. We will have thematic European workshops and webinars, and then very country-specific activities and tools that you will be presented. Train the trainer activities I mentioned already, and we will be giving online support to the trainers, including a nice virtual library. And we are working with other IEE-funded projects, Intelligent Energy Europe-funded projects, such as LEAP, Cascade, and Netcom, to connect and not reinvent the wheel, but make the wheel stronger. So thank you very much. We have a nice team that is here as your reference as well. Um, and I hope you link and connect to us, and I hope you ask your questions today. Uh, nice opportunities for interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Applause. <laughs> what has been the most fun so far? The most fun. I think f f for me this European dimension is wonderful. Mm. Um, people can bring in new ideas and there's always somebody else who can learn from those. That's yeah. absolutely incredible. We'll learn more from each other today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker uh, is the principal consultant at Intelligent RE. He's combining renewable energy expertise with software development. His current focus includes the development of growth strategies based on sustainable energy technologies for cities and regions. He's a tireless promoter of systemic view of integrating urban and rural energy flows. So please welcome Jan van Staden. Hi. Question to the technical guys, can I close this? Uh, are you going to kill me if I close it? Okay. <laughs> Survival is suddenly a big thing for me. So Usually I do this in, in advance, so I don't have to waste your time with it. But I actually just got here because I, I got on the wrong train from Malmo, which is like tricky. But it's probably the only sightseeing I'll manage to do uh, during my stay here. And there's nothing more pathetic than a fat man running off to the wrong train. <laughs> I gotta tell you. So I'm glad you were here and you missed it. I had to live. I had to live through it. It wasn't so great. <laughs> By the time the uh, folks on the train stopped laughing at me, they were actually able to help me get back here in more or less one piece. So. Let's see. It's my cat, by the way. 
She's great. She's fabulous. Okay. Right. Hang on, that's not right. Ah, that's it. Always good to start with a clean slate. Good morning. Uh, let's see if I can get this guy going. Yeah, 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 yeah. You saw my name there for a second. I work for a company called Intelligent Renewable Energy. Thank you for the introduction, uh, by the way. And um, I was asked to talk about this. Um, it's uh, CCSE UTC NFLA. Um, unfortunately, the title didn't fit on a single slide with a photograph, so I had to make a little uh, abbreviation. But it boils down to climate change and sustainable energy, understanding the context and need for local action. And they gave me half an hour, but I only need about two minutes, I think. It works basically like this. Bad energy causes nasty emissions. Nasty emissions mess up the climate. Climate change equals dead people and chaos. Dead people and chaos is bad. Good local energy saves the climate. The stable climate is good. So use good local energy. Thank you. So we have about 27 minutes left. Um, I was born in South Africa. No, I'm just, just kidding. Um, Climate change and local action for a lot of people seem to imply some sort of contradiction, some sort of dichotomy. It's an English word that's often misused, but it's not really true. Um, and I'll put a line through it to show that it's actually not really true because climate change and local action are extremely complementary. Um, we're lucky in that sense because you can't really do local action that reduces emissions um, without helping ameliorate the impact of climate change globally. So you can't really do anything wrong from a climate change perspective. So, you know, it's, it's fine. Climate change is for everybody. It's something everybody worries about. Local action is something that your constituency is more involved in. Um, but there seems to be no real contradiction. The only question you have to ask yourself is, um, if climate, local climate actions help everybody, then why don't we just do it somewhere where it's cheap? Why not just do CDM instead of doing it here where it's more expensive? It's a good question. And I can answer it by saying we need local action now. Climate change or no climate change. Even if you didn't care or do not care about climate change, even if you think climate change is for gooks, we need local action now for a whole bunch of other reasons. And that's the context maybe that we need to talk about a little bit today. Because we live in a kind of slavery at the local level. Because unless you have one of these in your local city swimming pool, one of these in the local city park, and one, in the, one of these in your town hall parking lot, you're living in a kind of slavery of sufficiency. You're constantly running after the ability to provide you, yourself and your environment and your economy with enough energy in a way that you can actually afford. Sufficiency also implies money. So if you don't have enough money, you don't have enough energy, then sufficiency breaks down. And there's a bunch of ways that, that the slavery of sufficiency weighs down on you like, a, like a, an atlas carrying a big ball of well, coal, I guess, or something like that. Because there's so many things, if you don't have those lovely things in your park and in your swimming pool and so on, that that sufficiency thing can break down with the current energy balance and the current en energy model that you're using. Your, your gas pipeline can explode on the outskirts of town. Your favorite oil tanker can end up looking like that. The bad guys can get to the energy first. Your favorite oil platform might wash up on the beach. 
And then you have what we call in technical terms a real problem. And because it bears down on your ability to grow and develop like that, that slavery of sufficiency is a kind of economic slavery. Because we're all about growth, but this dependency, this slavery, binds your ability to grow because a whole bunch of unpleasant things, unexpected things, unwanted things and unneeded things tend to happen And it makes predicting and developing and planning growth extremely hard at the end of the day. Why is it like that? Because when you're importing energy, you're exporting money. Big container, container loads full of money. And at the same time, you're re reducing your resilience against some of these nasty things that I just showed you. In fact, basically what you're doing with importing energy is you're just tempting fate. But you can't let go. You can't let go because energy is everything to us. Energy is a drug. And we're working to reduce our dependency on that drug through energy efficiency, but you're never going to get rid of it. It's a monkey on your back until the day you die. You need that energy. And if you know that you have a problem like this, the best thing you can do is be your own dealer. At least then if you owe money, you owe it to yourself. Because in the current model of things, the only thing you know is that you don't know what's going to happen next. It's probably the only sure thing you can say about the oil and gas business. You don't know. It's a little bit like playing one of these things. Because you predict stuff, and you plan according to that, and then something happens and suddenly we're half a million, half a billion barrels a day short, and prices go up, and who knows? And you know prices go up, you know that. If I gave you a blank little bit of space on my blackboard there and said, draw me the development of the oil price over the last hundred years, corrected, and you ended up drawing something like that, you'd be exactly right. It does go up. It will go up. And even if it goes down, the energy cost for the end user doesn't go down. It's never gone down. It always goes up. Whereas what we really need, what we really need, instead of all of this headache and heartache, just a few simple things. We need guaranteed supply. We need stable price development. We need positive socio-economic side effects. We want it to be climate neutral. We want our energy to be climate neutral. We want it to be resilient. Hell, we want it to be sexy. And honestly, your current energy regimen, unless your mom, <laughs> probably isn't any of these things, and it's definitely not sexy. And it turns out that there's a significant answer to be found within the context of local renewables and energy efficiency because, honestly, it gives you back your pride. It gives you back that pride in being able to look after yours and your own and yourself. How does it work? How can we, how can we regain our pride? In the urban context, we know how it works. You know how it works. Can draw a simple black and white picture to show exactly how it works. You take these technologies and the things we've learned about buildings and other things in terms of energy management and integrate it into your urban planning process, your urban development process. Make sure that you have solar panels and green roofs and overhangs for shading and cool roofs and additional density, additional height, second units, bike lanes, bus lanes, the whole shibos. <coughs> if you're not doing this, you ought to be. If you are doing this, that's good, because this is already a little bit passé. This is a little bit yesterday, already. Today, we're taking much more of a systems approach. We're saying, well, this, this is familiar to, I think, to a lot of you, having a look at what we have and how these things can interact and interrelate. In fact, we go even a little bit further than that. 
looking at cities as energy systems and do systems integration and optimization on those cities. <coughs> Very simple, take a line, do a lot of measurements for a whole lot of processes happening in your city. The minus part is the consumption part of every process, the plus part is the production side in case it produces any energy or has any energetic waste. Then we figure out exactly what those things are and what they do, add them all up, and you have a total that's probably quite horrific and horrifying. And then you start looking at these things and trying to tie together the energy outflows of one process and tying them to the inflows of another to try and link them up so that you get these things to balance out. Tie, tie them together one by one. Where you can, you try and replace the inputs with something green. And then at the end of the day, with a little bit of luck, through a process of integration and optimization, you have actual energy use and waste that's far lower than what you started with, without having to change the functional side of such a system. If you haven't done one of these diagrams yet, it's great fun. Pretty cool. So basically what we're doing is we're seeing energy everywhere in a city. You remember the movie The Matrix? Where he's in the corridor and he just got shot and came back to life. And everything becomes this information flow. The entire structure is just... I think I can do that. Hang on, give me... Yeah, cool. Everything is just information flow. Cities are like that from an energy perspective. They're just one big energy flow everywhere. Everything has got energy in it. Just have to reach out and stick your hands in there, get them dirty and change things. Actually, the question that we're most involved with at the moment is how big should these systems that we're looking at be? Now, if you have a big city like New York, maybe you want to think smaller, little blobs, little units, interconnected units. If I have a mid-sized city, maybe I, you know, where, where do I stop? Where does it stop being interesting? Where does it stop being valuable to chase these things down? And where does it stop being fun? I can tell you, it stops being fun when you start following these systems out to the guys who provide our energy at the moment. That stops being fun. But the reason I raise this point is because it brings us to something that is fundamentally critical to your thinking, or ought to be, but probably hasn't really played such a massive role yet for everybody. That's this whole urban, peri-urban, rural business. How do we manage to sort that out and make that work for us? And these are not new concepts to you. You know, you can scribble it down on a little piece of paper. It's something that's urban, sort of in the middle, peri-urban, somewhere around, and then there's something rural. It's very difficult to define. You've probably got administrative borders to these things. They probably are just lines on a map that have got nothing to do with the real thing happening on the ground. But that doesn't matter. It turns out that if you look at these three components as a system, you really start hitting pay dirt. It becomes completely exciting and a completely new world. That's a density map of Atlanta. Area in black is the highest density part of the city. The area in red is the highest energy density part of the city. The area in blue is the part of the city least useful for producing new and renewable energies. So we see the problem here when we just focus on the city. The city is really good for, con for consuming energy. So it's a good place for energy efficiency, but when, it looks at, when you're starting to look at production, to actually close that system off, close that cycle off, it's the worst place to look, because there ain't no space. Now, if you coat everything with PV, it's still just going to be a drop in the bucket. So I've made a few slides. I, 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 I loathe complicated slides. I do not do complicated slides. But I've made some complicated slides because it helps us focus our thinking a little bit. Now, you have to... Bear with me. If you have to explain a slide, then you know it's, it's too complicated. The bottom is sort of the urban, peri-urban, rural. So if you look, if you can imagine if you look from the top, they would have been circles. Yeah? <coughs> and what happens in each of those blocks between the dotted lines relates to that particular part of the rural, peri-urban and urban segment that's underneath it. So let's do, as we did just for Atlanta, Let's just look at energy density and generation potential. 
So that's energy density. We knew that. In the city, obviously, highest energy density in the rural areas is less. We knew this. Obvious. Generation capacity turns out to be highest in the urban area, in the uh, rural areas, lowest in the urban area. And to anybody with any grain of systems thinking, that just shouts out, use me. I fit. This is a match. Let me produce energy in the rural and peri-urban area and let's use it in the urban area and everything will be, well, flatter graph-wise anyway. If we look at population change in those areas, demographically, and the investment need to maintain the current infrastructural standing of those areas, then we know that in the rural areas people are moving away and they're moving into urban areas, typically globally. It's not the same everywhere, I know. And in the peri-urban areas, people come, people go. If you look at the investment that's necessary to keep people where they are and keep them happy where they are, the investment in rural areas are per capita much higher. And that screams out, use me. And if you combine these two graphs, it just says, system, dude, system. We have a system. So, let's look at the technologies that we would typically use on the generation side, because we know where the energy is being used and we know where to focus our efficiency issues. Let's look at, I've just mixed them up. Some of them are production technologies, some of them are fuel production technologies, some of them are actual generation capacity production technologies. It doesn't matter really for our purposes. If you look at PV, it should be in the cities where it's visible and sends the right message and all of these sorts of things, but it's never going to have enough space. In the rural areas, you have unused land, you can put in nice utility scale generation things, everybody's happy. It just works out that way. Wind, you can imagine, is exactly the same. Geothermal, trust me, the deeper wells you want further away from your cities. I have a few nasty examples I can mention. Biofuel production, there's the transport aspect. You can use it in the city. You can also produce it in the city, but you can produce it in the countryside. You can also use it in the countryside. And so all of these technologies have their little use gradients. A couple of them are unusual. That's solar thermal. We want that in the city where we need the heat. But on average, most of these technologies are more replicable in the peri-urban and the surrounding countryside area than in the city. And we can use the energy that we generate for the cities, where they are less useful to some extent. These things just match. So how do we make a system like that, that covers <coughs> urban, peri-urban, and rural? How do we make it stick? How do we make that one manageable unit. Unfortunately, people get in the way a little bit because you need unified policy. You need people to actually work together, think together. It's a little bit tough. We're not always used to doing that with our neighbors. And it gets harder because you do need to manage these things together. You also need to encourage the growth of local independent utilities. Big national utilities are poison to a situation like this. You need local utilities that can sign long-term contracts to produce energy in the countryside and feed it into the city. You need to submit it to a constant optimization and requirements management process, and you need to really internalize innovation and systems thinking. Then you can make it work. I have another one of these. Sorry. Actually, two more. But anyway. These are a little bit simpler. Our region, which inherently consists of an urban, a peri-urban, a rural area, has a relationship with big business and oil-producing countries, whether OPEC or no. It's a slightly one-sided relationship, but we have a business relationship with these people that we should acknowledge. We give them money. For different things, and they give us these different things. Gas, oil, petrol, electricity, 
for urban and peri-urban, gas, oil, diesel, electricity, and interestingly enough, fertilizers, and a whole bunch of other things as well, but let's just use fertilizers as a representative product, because many, many of the fertilizers, very significant portion of the fertilizers we use on a day-to-day basis in the rural areas, come from petrochemical processes. And now we buy the seeds from big companies. It's like we somehow we just never, never saw the hook. But anyway, point being, we give these people, these friends of ours, large amounts, obscenely large amounts of money. I mean, we are talking truly obscene portions of our product, gross product. And in return, they give us energy, the energy we need to do business. How does that look as a graph? Well, it means we have a certain output, a cost, money that flows out of where we are, out of our community, forever. It's gone. In return, we're able to use that energy to generate value, to do business, to provide services, feed ourselves, and so on. And any difference between these two things is the real benefit to the community that we've managed to achieve. That tiny little bit at the top left over. And some communities flourish and thrive on that, and others have a really tough time managing. Now, let's say we change our scenario ever so slightly and do business with some new colleagues, namely ourselves. But magically transformed into an energy system. And we do the same thing. For the same amount of energy, we give ourselves a large amount of money. In exchange for which, we get energy. Instead of gas, maybe we get biogas. Instead of oil for heating, maybe we get wood pellets. Instead of petrol, maybe we get biofuel. And electricity suddenly comes from green sources like PV, biomass, wind, and so on. Hydro, and so on. Many of these processes which produce byproducts that turn out to be excellent fertilizers. Of course, these things don't always match that way, but in this case it does, and it helps us tear ourselves loose, and it means that the nutrients that are required for these processes also flow through our system the way it's supposed to. Let's go back to our little graph. We have the same amount of money flowing out, in theory, but the nice thing is that a portion of that stays home within the community. That portion is represented on the inside here. From the same amount of energy, we can produce the same amount of value. But the benefit to the community suddenly looks very, very different indeed. As a reminder, before, after. And in all of this, I am not counting. I am not counting the jobs that we've created locally, the reduced transport losses, the stable pricing, lower inflation, and the good that does our local economy, the issue of partial, possibly, energy autonomy that we've gained, the resilience, and half a dozen other beneficial social socioeconomic factors that we haven't even touched on yet. So what am I saying? Really? You're going to need energy. You can reduce the amount for a specific task But if you do more tasks, or you have more people, or you even just have the people you have, and you do new things, you're going to need energy. There's no getting around it. But. There's the message. Fully utilizing 
the available spectrum of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies in a transparent, well-integrated and explored energy system that tightly couples the demands and potential resources of the urban, peri-urban and surrounding rural areas in your region is a really, really good idea. And that's actually all I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. The obvious question being, why isn't it happening faster? Are we seeing this happening today somewhere, or is it just you dreaming it up? Um, no, it's just me dreaming it. <laughs> okay, thank you so uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, is, it is happening, and it's happening perhaps more slowly than we would like, simply because we've followed the systemic approach for food production. We've followed the systemic approach for water management. We've followed it for game and nature reserve management. We've followed it for all kinds of things in our lives. So the only thing left really is energy. But energy is such a creepy guy. It's everywhere and it's almost invisible. So if you start looking for it, to try and put these systems together properly, to put these energy flows together properly, and to come up with ways that you can intercouple the processes and produce the sort of um, energy sources in your, in your rural areas that you can feed into, all of these sorts of things. You need to take the time to sit down and work these things out. You need to pull in experts, you need to pull in people who, who understand a variety of different production technologies, who understand rural, and rural management, who understand agriculture, who understand... It's a multidisciplinary thing that requires every single department in the city administration and in the surrounding city administrations and in the local rural administrations surrounding them to work together. You know how hard it is to do that just inside a city. This is tough. So it's taking longer because it is harder, but it's worth it. The potential is phenomenal, and that's why sometimes to get the big money, the big results, the big returns, you need to put in the big effort and... But how do you, how do you deal with the utility companies? They've got massive sunken costs and basically going to tell them that you're not going to get any money from us anymore. Well... That's not a great way for them to be involved. No, no. And uh, to be honest, my heart bleeds for them. Um, we have a, no, it doesn't. Um, we, have, we increasingly see a massive counter-movement in Europe and elsewhere. In the 70s, everybody, all the cities sold their utilities. And these got conglomeratized and turned into very nasty big customers like E.ON and EMBW. Now, cities are fighting back, creating their own utilities again, supporting the creation of local utilities around generation infrastructure that wasn't there before. Can you give any examples? Where is this happening? Oh, Freiburg is an example. Yeah. Good thing. Glad you asked. Yeah. Um, where we see uh, the creation of a local... Uh, city-owned utility, which has now become part of a group of utilities owned by a group of cities to really get a bit of mass. At the same time, in that environment, we have a number of independent utilities providing energy from anything from small hydro to wind and PV. And all of these interact by offering packages to the city and to people living in the area of buying regional and regional green electricity to different kinds of things. People are jumping on this en masse. Our own electricity in our house, for example, comes purely from water from a local utility whose head office I can hit with a stone if I throw it out my window. That's the way it ought to be. Our city has shifted its public transport from conventional to green energy by buying green energy in, not from one, but from a collection of these local utilities meaning that public transport, which is a great environmentally friendly thing already, becomes even more environmentally friendly simply by virtue of really tying down these long-term capacity, local capacities using long-term delivery contracts. That is exactly what these small utilities need to ensure that they survive. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And your pleasure. And we will now turn to the uh, perspective of local political leaders uh, as I welcome uh, two of them to, uh, on stage. And let me first shortly introduce them to you. Uh, 
Maybe we should get this moved down so we can see people in the panel. And there we go. Sure. Uh, first of all, we have Atanaska Nikolova. She's been the deputy mayor for European policies and environment in Burgas municipality since 2009. Please welcome on stage. Um, I can tell you she's responsible for the preparation and implementation of EU funded projects um, and the environmental protection in Burgas. If you haven't heard of the city, it's uh, on the shores of the Black Sea, surrounded by the large Burgas Bay and the, and the largest city in southeast Bulgaria, fourth largest in the country. And then we have Helena Hejmovic. She's responsible for environmental protection and urban mobility in the city of uh, Koprinica. Koprinica. Thank you. Uh, and she's all but contributed to the development of local Agenda 21 in the city um, and the development of the local sustainable energy action plan. Thank you. Um, Atanaska, I know you've been doing a lot and achieved positive results. Could you tell a bit more about what you've been doing in, in sort of in the public buildings? Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's Sorry. <laughs> it's quite difficult to, to speak after the previous lecture. Uh, so I should say that uh, we are uh, a bit out of date, not so modern in our approach. But uh, it's worth to share our, uh, share our experience, I think, because uh, just for two years, uh, when actually our local energy action plan was developed and we started to work on uh, <coughs> the different topics, not only the buildings, uh, we succeed to make energy audit of all our uh, public uh, property, all buildings, and to implement uh, <coughs> energy efficiency measures in more than 40 buildings. It is uh, schools, kindergartens, social houses, uh, sport complexes. And uh, still our investments are bigger than our savings, I mean, in financial aspects, but uh, uh, believe me, it's, uh, it's worth to start to, to work on that. How long is the, the payback time? When do you expect to get your money back? Um, not more than five years. Not more than five years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what's been the, the sort of why did you start engaging in local climate and energy action? Has there been a, a starting point or is there a general idea that this is good oh. for us? Y you mentioned that uh, Burgas is uh, for the biggest city in Bulgaria. So mm. we are very important industrial, tourists and... Um, culture center and big urban center. So as uh, the other fast growing cities, we, we suffer uh, all typical problems, including environmental problems. problems. And of course, it means uh, uh, it's a problem of quality of life of our citizens, mm. uh, especially air quality problems. So w one of the biggest motivation to start to work on our energy uh, local energy action plan was to improve quality of life, quality of urban environment. And uh, there's not the only one, but uh, the other one is that uh, Burgas uh, has an ambition to be a leader and to uh, probably w this was the reason that we w were among the, the first cities that signed the Covenant of Mayors in 2009. Mm -hmm. And we would like to play a leading role in these uh, actions. Helena, you've also been a, a leader in this field. Could you give us a quick insight into what you've been doing? Uh, well, <coughs> um, our city has indeed been a leader in uh, energy efficiency area. Uh, first of all, in the, in the, the planning of uh, uh, sustainable development since we were the first city in Croatia to develop a um, um, local agenda 21 and we based all our uh, policies on it. Uh, we started from a vision as well. We had a very high ambition. We are a very small city but uh, quite well known for, for our uh, industry 
But also, we live in the north of the country that is traditionally uh, the agricultural area. So we see a lot of potential. And I can only congratulate the previous speaker for putting it so clearly. Uh, this is where our potential lies, and I think we have a bright future. I know that, that children and pets love you because you have a talent for spoiling them. Um, isn't there a risk that you also spoil your citizens by taking care of them and making all the energy efficiency work for them? Um, well, I bit. don't think so. <laughs> uh, it's uh, important... Uh, the, the city, the, the administration to play a leading role and to play uh, a role of, uh, uh, to show a good examples. Uh, because uh, uh, it's clear for us that uh, in order to achieve the, the positive results, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it is not enough uh, only administration to change a behavior, only municipal projects uh, for energy efficiency uh, to, to, to be implemented in order to, to really achieve a visible results uh, in, in sustainable energy management. Uh, it means uh, that uh, all stakeholders should be involved. It should be, uh, an, um, it should be activities that uh, all the citizens uh, uh, should participate in. So, actually, um, our, our effort is uh, uh, to involve the citizens in, and to, uh, to get them on the board to start uh, the, the work to think and to do, to act in the energy efficiency field. Great. And we'll have a session later on today where we'll explore this even further. Helena, I know that you're a cyclist. Um, so what have you learned from your cycling experience sort of getting everybody on the bike and start biking towards the future? Well, <clears throat> I'm sure I am a cyclist and I have, uh, as, a, as a politician, I'd say, I've played it uh, a, a very good part, I would say. Uh, I haven't got a driving license. I never had it. So I've made uh, one of my faults, actually my virtue, and I've, I've exploited it to the full. So I cycle everywhere where I can. I uh, try to encourage other people to cycle because my city is a cyclable city. We've had a very long tradition of cycling and walking. So uh, we, we reinvented cycling, so to speak. Uh, we uh, we were proud to to win the Mobility Week award, which which as a city of for. So if we focus uh, on the leadership lesson here, is it sort of just to be out there and be visible and, and get people? Absolutely, absolutely. You have to you have to encourage people by your own example. Yeah. So since I do not drive a car, I I have served as a good example that even the older ladies can cycle, even though they are very very clumsy as I am. And uh, that uh, cycling is not really dangerous. It's fun. Once that you try it, you, you, you are a cyclist forever. But I do know that you've been involved in sort of a dozen accidents or so. <laughs> so how does one make sure that as a politician that these climate initiatives aren't being run over that you end up in a ditch? <laughs> well, actually, uh, I don't do anything uh, but go on. So I think that even as a politician, it, it teaches you a lesson. Yeah. Even though you fall down, you get up again, you try to, be, to, 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 to pretend to be unhurt and uh, you just go on. <laughs> <laughs> Just brush it, brush it off yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, and we shall now move on to the next plenary session. Applaud. Thank you. Thank you.